Friends, welcome back to another of the nation's weekly podcasts where we feel like it's our our duty, our honor, our privilege to get to try and find people that we think are fascinating, we think are inspiring, who have not only interesting things to say, but incredible stories to tell about what God's done in their lives and what they've seen God do in the world. And this week is no exception. Sitting with us is quite possibly one of the more interesting human beings that I've had the pleasure of meeting. Her name is Wendy Hinman. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Joseph. Hi, Joel. Hi, welcome. <laughs> and I was just going to say, good thing we ha- we know great people and we have great friends. I know. It's it like is. a friend's podcast thus far. Thus far, it yeah. it has been. And we and have a great friend on today. Dude, we do have a great friend. Uh, Wendy is many, many things. Um, she is, uh, well, she's also got a very fascinating husband named John, um, mm-hmm. who rides the train every morning up into Compton to go teach at a public school, which is cool. But that's all we're going to say about John because this podcast is about Wendy. That's right. <laughs> um, although I guess it's also about John too, because yeah. uh, it's about your guys' life that you shared together. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so Wendy does a lot of things very well. She's an, a gifted writer. She actually wrote the cover story for uh, Volume 7 of yep. Nations Media with Dr. Brian Fisher. Probably one of the more challenging assignments that I've given anybody. And I think I apologize apologized to her on more than one occasion uh, and thanked her for her tenacity. But she is also probably one of our favorite uh, Bible teachers that we've yes. ever heard preachers. Runs Carlsbad Magazine. Uh-huh. She is a senior writer over at Carlsbad Magazine. And so- we here in Carlsbad have the best magazine. Everyone has their little city magazines, but I'm telling you, Carlsbad reigns supreme and we have Wendy to thank. We do. Watch out, world. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. She's also an accomplished, I mean, everything. She teaches kids around, like kids and adults around the world, how to play and how to discover God through play. Mm-hmm. Um, and she also climbs every mountain. Um, I feel like Wendy, Wendy is the one where she'll, we'll be on the podcast today uh-huh. and we'll see her Instagram tomorrow and she'll be like in Wyoming. Yep. Yeah. It's and I'm always totally like, how true. do you time, yeah, yeah. Yeah. she like time travels. Yeah. Infuriating, um, as an editor she's, to have as a writer, infuriating because she's like too busy out there living life gosh. and having fun adventures to like write us a story, which is fine, yeah. which is, is fine. It's good for me to have that, you know, like deer that I'm always chasing. Uh, so anyways, uh, we're just so grateful that you are joining us for the podcast to talk about um, a number of things, but we've got a, a wild topic. You guys ready to learn about cults? Yeah. Buzzword. Buzzword. Yes. Um, yeah. Before we dive into that, Wendy, um, yeah. Could you just share like, hey, where are you from originally? Um, were you born into a family of faith or anything like that? So originally, no. My uh, father was an atheist. My mom was an agnostic. Okay. And there were five kids in the family, and I always I always say that my my father was a bad atheist because he took us to Yosemite, oh. and just seeing Yosemite, yeah, because he was also a, a landscape architect, and he and he would say that that no one could design a garden like nature, and so that you know when you go up the forty one and you come out the tunnel, oh, yeah. and there's uh-huh. Yosemite yeah, Valley, yeah, yeah. it's oh. like. I understand glaciers and volcanoes and, you know, uplift and all that, but it is designed Mm. and it was designed by somebody. And I didn't know Mm. what that meant, you know, in my eight year old brain. Mm. And I didn't know that what I was feeling was worship, Mm. but that was kind of the beginning. Wow. So eight years old, you encounter Yosemite and that like sparks or awakens, um, like a spiritual awareness in, yeah. in lots of different yeah. ways. Okay. So from there, you're growing up in uh, with a bad atheist and... It, yes, in, in, a, a, in a, a small agma- surf town okay. on the coast of California, Carlsbad. Yes. And grew up here, but so different than it is right now. How so? Um, if you go to the Carlsbad flower fields, uh-huh. okay, you know, it's this... I forget how many acres it is right now, mm. but it's a patch. Yeah. Imagine those flowers going all the way to the 101. Wow. And all the way to the border of Carlsbad. And then on the other side was Paul Lecky Poinsettias. Oh, yeah. And then if you turn north, it was uh, Briggs Poinsettias. What schools did you go to in the community here? Uh, it wasn't Poinsettias. Sorry, it was Bird of Paradise. Very important. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So Magnolia, I went to yeah, Magnolia. That's where my kids went. Yeah, when it was okay. a brand new school. And then I, I was a Valley Viking. Yeah. And then 
than I am a loyal Carlsbad Lancer. Yes, go Lancers. <laughs> My kids, yeah. same trajectory, and Liam now is playing baseball for the Lancers. Oh, Very special. Nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I love the. I just love. Um, I always wanted to be a part of a community that has um, such a beautiful history, where the people yeah. are still a part of the community mm -hmm. and um, invested in the community. And Carlsbad seems to have that. And you're yeah. you, like <laughs> everybody who I meet, kind of along the journey, like. Um, you know, my favorite restaurant in town is Lola's and Lola's yes. is like the, this mission of, of Carlsbad. Mm -hmm. It feeds yeah, yeah. all the kids right. and they've been, you know, they, they're, they're just, um, they're spiritual leaders in our community. They're just, yeah. it's just yeah. awesome. And, uh, and I know you have a long relationship with everyone there. And so I just, yeah, yeah I, I love, um, I love your love for the community and I'm jealous that yeah, you, yeah. you, uh, have been a part of it yeah. for your entire life. It was kind of kind of a challenge right now because, you know, Ophi Escobedo mm -hmm. passed away from mm -hmm. Lola's and Francis passed a while ago. Connie's the last one, and she was going to be in Lola's for their 80th anniversary of the business. Yeah. So I went, you know, and sat and talked to Connie, but then someone else came up to greet her, and Henry Treo, yeah, came up to me and he said, "We are the elders now." Yeah, and there was a sense of duty and obligation. Yeah, yeah. With that, mm. that, you know, this generation, that generation is passing and now we are the elders and mm. what are we going to do? Yeah. Well, isn't it part of the role of the elders is to help us young pups um, discern what wisdom is and to avoid the traps and the pitfalls of the world around us? So I'm hoping that you can do some of that for us today. Elder Wendy, although yeah. you don't live or look like an elder. <laughs> uh, she is. The, she's, yeah, she's. I don't think I can keep up with her on the in the backcountry. So you meet. <laughs> so f take us quick, briefly from eight year old Wendy. Like any other notable things that kind of shaped or formed you in your mm -hmm. you know early adolescent years, young adulthood sort of thing. And then yeah. how do you end up meeting John? Okay, well, so uh, Carlsbad at the time had a program called MGM. Okay, well, so in first grade, uh, my first grade teacher told my parents that I was retarded and I should be institutionalized. No way. Um, cause I found, they found, I, you know, they found out I was dyslexic and, but there was no like remedial, no special classes mm -hmm. for that. So I just, you know, stayed in. I had a brilliant teacher in fourth grade, mm. uh, Mr. McIntyre, he a former Disney animator. And, uh, in his class, I was pulled out with these other kids and we were given these tests and I, we didn't know that they were IQ tests. Mm. And so kids that had a certain IQ were put in. MGM, it meant mentally gifted minors. By the time we got to middle school, we were supposed to do these research projects. Like one guy was, he was making a telescope, researching how to make a telescope. He was grinding the lenses. Uh, another guy was doing Mozart's theory on theory. And, but it was a hippie era, you know, it was the 70s. And so it was really popular to be a seeker. Mm. So that's what I would say. I was a, I, I'm a seeker. Mm. Because I couldn't, deny that there was a God mm. or a truth, but I didn't know what it was. So I'm going to seek it. So when I was in seventh grade, I started studying all the religions of the world. I didn't finish until I did Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam when I was at Valley. Mm. And then when I got to Carlsbad High, uh, TR was my MGM teacher. And he said, you have to do Christianity. And I didn't want to do it because it couldn't be as easy as the the church down the street. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, the short story is that I started researching mm. uh, Christianity in a very textbook way. And then I felt uh, disingenuous because I had read the Talmud, I'd read the Quran, I'd read the Vedas, you know, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to touch the Bible hmm. because I don't know why. I, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I thought, no, I gotta, I gotta do it. And so I went and found a Bible in my atheist parents' house, found out that actually my dad had won it for memorizing verses in Sunday school. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know why I, I don't know why I didn't start at the beginning like you do with any other book, mm -hmm. but I'm dyslexic. So I just opened it up. The very first Bible verse I read was, uh, the word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, mm. dividing asunder between soul and spirit, and is 
discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. And I slammed it and pushed it away. Like, dude, <laughs> dude, <laughs> whoa. And then if you go on a couple of other verses, it says everything is naked and open hmm. before him, who, uh, before the eyes of him. And I don't know what translation it was, but whatever translation it was, it said before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hmm. And I was like, dude, we have to do Mm. with this other. And then, uh, then, you know, then I just started uh, researching more. And one of the things that impressed me was that in all the other religions, except for Judaism, um, there was this striving to get to God. Mm. Mm -hmm. But in, and I was literally in a textbook, uh, it had a picture of the Sistine Chapel you know, the famous picture where God is reaching towards man and Adam's sort of like, you know, just kind of there. Just yeah. lifting up his finger. But that made a real impression on me yeah. that, that God is, he's really essentially doing all the work. Yeah. From Adam, where are you? To, you know, seeking, seeking us out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The common f finding, you know, it's like, yeah. I know the same for me. I was like, wait, so... In every system, the worshipers are climbing this ladder to their God and failing at some point, and it's like sacrificing their way up this ladder. And like the gospel, it's like flipped. Like the yeah. God is coming to me, coming down the right. ladder. Yeah. Like I got that like Jesus was a baby, and I, I I understood the cross and a little bit, but that this it just it it was reverse. Yeah. It was reverse of every other like philosophical or you know ethical or religious idea of what is right and wrong. It was like, this is so backwards. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Well, and more than that too, more than that too, right? Cause the gods come down in other religions, uh, like the Greek mm -hmm. pantheon of gods or in some of the, you know, Hindu scriptures as well. And, but the, it, they come down to seed chaos. They come down because they're envious and capricious. They're coming down because they want mm -hmm. to extract something or cause they yeah. fall in love with somebody, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, God, the God of the Christian narrative seems to come into, to lead us towards life, towards healing and to say like, well, actually draw us into this relationship. Yeah. Okay. So you have this, you had the, the eight year old Wendy gets awakened uh -huh. by Yosemite, the natural world. Yeah. The, the first gospel is the, as the, our Catholic friends would say, right. Yeah. Um, uh, and then you, you, <laughs> The Bible falls open to a searing verse yes. uh, that just kind of scorches your mind in lots of ways, um, but you persist to continue to learn about it, and uh -huh. you see this, yeah. this distinction. Um, so what does that do? Yeah, what does that do in the life and mind of Wendy? Take us on from there. Well, so what kicked me over the edge was um, probably the heaviest partiers at Carlsbad High invited me to Young Life. But of course, Christians. Yes. <laughs> Christians. No, they weren't Christians. Oh, they weren't. They no, just went to Young they Life. Weren't, they weren't Christians. <laughs> they just went to Young Life because they said it's really fun. Yeah, Young Life, knows how to, Young Life knows how to throw a good party, man. That's yeah. true. That's and so, true. you know, as a yeah, freshman in high school, you know, you want to have fun. And w But when I went, one of the things that impressed me was that it was clean fun. There was no pressure to drink, no pressure to hook up, you know, that kind yeah. of stuff. And then I would sort of endure their God talk. Hmm. You know, I'd have all the fun. There'd be a five minute God talk. But then it started to cross over where I was having the fun, but I was anticipating the God talk. Mm. And then I went to a Young Life winter camp and Randy Jusso was, oh, that's right. oh, my goodness. was preaching. Need, you need to get Randy a, yeah, in here. Yeah, we, we do need Randy. to get Randy in here. Um, Legend. You want to come help it, uh, do that interview? You should yeah, host yeah. that one. Yeah. yeah, I'll step off. You, you <laughs> take my spot. And you know, and then he, he was preaching on, on the woman from Luke 9, I believe, where uh, she touches the hem of his garment. Mm -hmm. And that really spoke to me. Um, because she was unseen mm. and she had this problem and I was the middle of five. So I was the unseen that could play invisibility both ways. Mm. And, um, and he stops and he, you know, Jesus stops to hear her story. Yeah. He, he knew she was healed, but he wanted that relationship. And so December 23rd, 1974. Epic. I, that is epic indeed. How old were you? I was 14. 14. No, I was 13. Yeah, no, I was 14. Just 14. Hmm. Wow. That's, I love that. And on, on so many levels, I just, I, I just, it's so cool to me when 
God reaches out and gets a hold of people. I mean, every story is unique and similar. And um, how does, okay, so like we all know where this is going. Can I just ask the question? You can. Yeah. <laughs> ask like, So how yeah. do you go from like, okay, like, whoa, this God loves me. Yeah. I love this God. Like I've kind of figured it out and I'm, yeah. I've had this encounter. It's amazing. How do you get caught up in basically a cult? Yes. That's, I mean, right. that's yeah. why we're all here, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, so in high school, so I'm a freshman in high school. So yeah. I go through all through high school. Um, my sister had gotten saved three months before me through Young Life. And so we were sort of, you know, sharing in our room, you know, stuff. But, and that's when the debate started. My parents were kind of like of the philosophy, oh, when they're older, they can decide. Yeah. Religion. But as soon as we decided, the debates began. So I didn't, not a lot of support at home, mm. you know, for faith. And I would go to churches here and there, but I didn't get it. Mm. You know, I just was like, what I had, you know, learned, it just didn't seem to make sense when I went to different churches. Mm. And then uh, for some reason, I thought, when I go to college, I'm going to really walk with the Lord. And so I went to Cal State Long Beach and... That I've, the first thing I that happened to me is I went through huge culture shock because mm. when I was growing up there was about nine thousand people in Carlsbad. Um, by the time I graduated from high school, there was more, but Cal State Long Beach had more students than people <laughs> in the city of Carlsbad. Oh my goodness! And so it was just overwhelming. Mm. And then I really think cults come out of a desire for community. Mm. Um, or tribalism, which could be... Yeah, it's own form of community, right? You know, yeah. So <clears throat> I started going to a Bible study. There were different ones. There was InterVarsity and there was Fellowship of Christian Athletes. But that seemed more like Young Life, like let's have the fun, the little God talk. Yeah. But the one I went to was all God talk. I learned how to read the Bible um, inductively. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we were just, we were a bunch of high school kids not high school kids, we're college kids that wanted to change the world for Jesus. Yeah. Mm. But we became this, you know, tight group of, of people. And then this older guy came mm. who knew more about the Bible than we did. And so without really, we just believed him. And so if you see the movie, Jesus Rev Revolution, yeah. this is kind of in the, it's still the Jesus, Jesus movement. Uh, Jesus people movement, but it's th kind of the later years. And <clears throat> this guy actually divided some of the houses uh, that w came together uh, at Calvary Jesus. Chapel. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So is it or you, know, you were in Orange County. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were just meeting, having Bible studies. And then this guy, Tim Giftakis, comes and he's you know, mm -hmm. just that much older than us. Mm -hmm. And then he takes, you know, he takes us on Sunday to Fullerton where his dad, George Giftak, is, is preaching. And, and we were all pretty young in the faith. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm trying to think. The only people who grew up in churches in that group grew up in Catholic churches. Mm. Okay. But then there was a, just a lot of people who had gotten saved during the Jesus People movement. So we didn't have that foundation. And so he was... You know, he was preaching, and we were just believing it. Mm. So, how do you pronounce his name again? Giftak Giftakis. Giftakis. Okay, so George Giftakis is the head of what? It's called the the assembly. The assembly is kind of what it was. What it became. What it became. Yes, mm. because we believed that you don't take a name, because as soon as you take a name, you start to separate yourself from the greater body of Christ. Mm -hmm. But we totally separated ourselves yeah. from the greater body of Christ. <laughs> so can you articulate then, okay, so we've got a group of young kind of new believers who are really fervent and ardent in your faith. You guys yeah. are the, you guys are the tribe that is, yeah, hungry for going deeper and yes. learning more. And then um, you essentially get recruited by Tim, his son, uh -huh, so yeah. he he comes and hears about this Bible study of these you know zealous young folks who want to change the world for Jesus, and uh, he kind of says, "No, hey, come follow me to 
my dad's church. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, and some of the the Bible study I went to, they were already kind of doing that, hmm. but they were. Um, there was another couple that was Tim's age, and they were kind of running the Bible study, but they they were just you know down to earth. Yeah. You know, seeking just like we were, yeah. Yeah. much more transparent and honest. Yeah. So nothing sounds off yet. And yet. I know the, yes, I know the, the story yet. continues. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I know no one wakes up and, and goes like, hey, I think I'm going to join a cult today. Um, yeah. So how did the... How did the frog and water, you know, yeah. how, did the, how, yeah, did the, yeah. how did the water start to boil? And, and when did you notice it was hot? <laughs> well, that's the thing. Not till the very end. Yeah. You mm. know, probably the last five years is okay. when we really saw that and the, the, total the duration? water was hot. 25 years. 25 years. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's exactly it. It was this gradual, um, a very gradual thing. So we were just, we wanted to change the world. We wanted to know more about Jesus yeah. And we wanted to change the world for Jesus. So one of the things they got us out was out preaching the gospel. Recruiting is a good word, mm -hmm. but we didn't look at it that way. We were just out sharing the gospel. So every Friday night, we were out on the Huntington Beach Pier. Um, Tuesday nights, we had Bible study. Thursday night, we had prayer meetings. Some Friday nights, we had all nights of prayer. And then Sunday was all day for Jesus. So it was you know, morning worship. It would go almost to lunch. We'd have lunch, and then you'd have an afternoon meeting. And we, you know, we didn't see it back then, mm. but when you get married and start to have kids and you're doing that much during the week, yeah. um, you lose sleep. You, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you lose that meditative alone time because now you're meditating mm -hmm. in the word to, to be in the cult, you right. know, to be as smart and as spiritual mm -hmm. yeah. and all that stuff. And so you're, even your time in the word, uh, you know, gets a little warped and then you're studying it together. And so you're all, a lot of group think. Mm -hmm. Totally. Did, so yeah, I hear a couple of things that are kind of classic uh, markers of, of being in a cult, which is increasing isolation between like yeah. the community and the culture where it sounds yeah, like yeah. so much of your time is spent within this community, mm -hmm. um, yeah. like kind of like, <laughs> well, building each other up, frothing, mm -hmm. uh, as it were, and then only time that you're really going out into the culture is to evangelize or to recruit, right? To, yeah. To then, hey, come yeah. back and participate right. in this yes. this pretty insular sort yeah. of thing that we've got to, going. To tell the world right. that they got it wrong, uh, we got it right. Yes. So come here. And e that would even happen with Christians. Mm. You know, we were so smug, you know, because we had the truth. Right. We had the truth that nobody else saw, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. so it was like... Oh, they walk in the light that they have. I mean, how condescending. <laughs> yeah, sure. Is that? And we would like, you know, if I ran into you, I'd go, oh, Joel, where do you fellowship? And, and I'm not asking because I want to know if you're in a church. I want to categorize you. To figure it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's like where the Jesus movement kind of fell apart, right? Is because yeah. you had this beautiful organic thing that happened. It was like definitively a movement of God. And then... What, how do we articulate it? And then yeah. everybody groups, everybody kind of finds a tribe and then it's really, it looks no different than it did prior to the Jesus movement. It's like, you know. Right, yeah. Well, yeah, because, we, you know, Chuck Smith was known for bringing the hippies in. You yeah. know, they're coming in with dirty bare feet yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, they may or may not be on drugs while they're hearing the, hearing the sermon. Um, but you got to clean that up, you know, and, because there's rules. Right, and right. that's the thing is where legalism you know, really started to uh, creep in. I know you guys are going to give me this look like, God, I thought she was a smart woman. But, um, you know, we had to wear dresses on Sunday because yeah. very complimentary. Right. And um, we wore head coverings. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, the and full nine yards. The full nine yards. Oh, yeah, wow. it was... We were always confused because it's like women keep silent in the church, <coughs> but we could pray, we could worship, but we couldn't teach. Mm-hmm. You know, so that was, you know, and it was very orthodox. There was, in some teachings, it was the legalism that went off and then the mind control. Mm. A lot of... All right, you just said mind control. I'm going I'm gonna to I'm gonna have to stop you right there. Did and you just bring go, your tinfoil hat? <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> yeah talk to us about that. Um, yeah, what, is, what do you mean by that? Well, it's really subtle. Um, you know, like if you look at, like, freshman in college, I didn't know 
what a sociopath was. I didn't know mm -hmm. what a narcissist was. Um, and there was kind of group gaslighting mm. and uh, manipulation. So if you, you know, yes, we're saved by grace, but there's consequences for sin. And things became increasingly legalistic, not just with, um, like we didn't use instruments at worship. We sang congregationally, and there was this whole Bible teaching about, you know, at the end of the Old Testament, now it's the New Testament, and, and you don't do that anymore. Mm. And I'm, I'm trying to think of some of our other crazy things. Mm. But we would make things that might be good practice, but it became law. Right. And, and then that increased more and more. You know, like... Um, the fact that I have short hair and pierced ears, <gasps> that's just, you know. Mm. So you didn't back then? No, no, no not at all. This, Which, is, this is rebellious. Wendy, yes. That we... This is, yeah. And, and then that was hard for me to grow my hair long because my hair grows out <laughs> into a big fro. And so, uh, yeah, the wrestling with the hair was, was a huge thing. Mm. And just the way, you know, giving, it was, it was all this, you know, formulated groupthink mm -hmm. that was coming from this one guy. Right. Who could do no wrong. Even if you saw something wrong, it was justified and, you know, by the leaders. And it's funny because we said, like in each group, we, we, um, we didn't believe in having a pastor. So we had a plurality of leadership. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And I really think that was George's way of... of someone not getting too much power mm -hmm. so he could maintain the power like when it all imploded there was you know we just went wait a minute he's like the pope they're like the cardinals they're like the bishops uh -huh. <laughs> it's like we're doing it the same yeah exactly and yeah. uh okay so there's four prime i i uh you know did a, <laughs> a modicum of of research ahead of time um and we so i've already heard some of the four main characteristics of a cult are Authoritarian control. Mm -hmm. So um, cultism hinges on encouraging maximum obedience and um, kind of around an individual charismatic leader. So that's yes, George yeah, in yeah. this capacity. Yeah. And right? the isolation. Like um, you couldn't miss a Sunday. You know? What would happen if you did? Uh, it was really looked down on, yeah. you know, and you, you had to check with the leading brothers if you're going to be gone. Oh, wow. You know? Because uh, that's extremist beliefs is is number two. Cult members hold to very dogmatic and rigid beliefs. They're unable to question these belief systems without punishment yeah. uh, from the leadership or other group members. Right, yeah. So you kind of start seeing... Did you did you notice that where like uh, a little bit of the big brother or you're, you're narking or reporting on other people? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then isolation from society mm -hmm. as soon as new and members... And from families. And from... Okay. Families of origin. Oh, really? Yeah. Because they would emphasize the the Bible verses, like, you know, where Jesus says, unless you... Leave your mother and your father your, and yeah. come after me. Yeah. And, and you know, it equates it to hate and, you know, and ju they just would formulate it, um, you know, when Jesus says, uh, you know, what's the one where foxes have, you know... Have Boxes hole, have holes and, and something have dens, but yeah. uh, Son of Man has nowhere to lay, lay his head. Yeah, and then the next yeah. one is, you know, let me go say goodbye. That was it. Let oh, me yeah. go say goodbye to my family. Oh, no, you know, leave your... They and would let just, the dead bury the, the dead. Let the dead bury the dead. Yeah. They would just, you know, make those really big. So anytime you're really with family, there was pressure to... It wasn't really, oh, I'm getting together with my family to celebrate someone's birthday. Mm -hmm. I'm going to a family birthday <clears throat> party to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's a mission. Yes, yeah, so it's a mission. And so your family became... Which leads in a lot of ways to over-spiritualizing yeah. things, right? Like, oh, oh if, I, yes. if there's something I want to do, I have to find... I have to, I have to bend over backwards to find some justi like spiritual justification for doing this. You yeah, know, yeah. When you can't just go hang out with your family and yeah. celebrate a birthday. I, I remember when John and I first got married, we, um, we went on a 10-day honeymoon, which was frowned upon. Because... After about seven days, your brain starts to change, hmm. you know? And so if you're <laughs> locked in this way of thinking, and, and it really happened, 
You know, mm. there was a reason they were afraid for that because we started questioning things. But then we came back and then right before we knew it, we were trapped in the culture again. Drank the Kool-Aid again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, isolation. So authoritarian control, extremist beliefs, isolation from society, and then veneration of a single individual. Sounds like yep. we've we've heard we've ticked all the boxes. We've ticked all, we've ticked all the boxes. <laughs> and congratulations, we can we can confirm after some investigation that Wendy, you did participate in what became a cult. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting to me is, you know, when I hear the word cult, and I, and I don't want to not diminishing this at all, because this yeah. and I think this is my question. Like like if the the Netflix documentary Wild Wild Country, have you seen that? Uh -uh. It's about the Roshnish up in oh, Oregon. Oh yeah yeah yeah. And it's oh, cool. Like I it's have a, seen it. It's a young Just life. It's been a while. It's a young life camp now that I yeah. actually spoke at. Wow. And I and I Wild Horse Canyon. Wild Horse Canyon. Yeah, and yeah. and I, I'm like one of my my talks to all these high school kids. I'm like, and you know this used to be a sex cult. They're like, <gasps> they're like what? what? Yeah. I'm like, yes, they didn't. <laughs> Go watch the Netflix documentary with your parents. Sign off. But, yeah um, yeah. <laughs> but um. You know, and I, and you watch that movement start and it mm -hmm. starts kind of obviously in the East and it's, um, it just progressively gets bad, like every yeah, chapter. Yeah. And I know that's filmmaking and it's, there's, right, it's, yeah, but yeah. I mean, it, from going to like, Hey, I want to be around this person for spiritual enlightenment. That's yeah, a good yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, I want to be in this community as we, um, what's yours is mine and what's mine is yours. That's a yeah, great, yeah. that's a, that's a great thing. I, yeah, there's yeah. been, you know, um, healthy community, healthy yeah. spirituality, mentorship, discipleship. Right, you can yeah. label all these things as, as normal. Yeah. But when they start like poisoning the town's water where they're trying to get like a, Oh a, yeah. I yeah. Mean, you know, and trying to actually, you know, and it becomes like an actual yeah, yeah. sex cold and like all the crazy things these cults are known for. I guess what, um, you know, my, my, my question here in this conversation is, um, when did you start to realize that, okay, this might not be discipleship, what we thought it was. This right, is actually yeah. spiritual abuse. Mm -hmm. This might yeah, not yeah. be community, healthy community that we right. longing for. Yeah. It's actually really manipulative and really controlling. Mm -hmm. And like, when did, cause, cause again, it's just how you paint yeah, it. Yeah. They're painting it one way. Like, I guess, um, yeah. When were, when was that aha moment for you and yeah. John and. Well, and one, one of the things that keeps you in that too is, is very few people lived alone. So like, even as a married couple, like when we got married, then we had a training house. A training is, house. Is what we called it. So mm -hmm. like I lived with three gals you know, when I was in college, he lived with three guys. But then when we got married, we lived alone very shortly before then we had a training home. So we had three college women living with us and we were training them and we had like head stewards of the house. And, um, wow. you know, I had to submit to John, but so did they, you know, and, wow. and it just, there was that. And then there was, it was almost the doomsday thing where we talked a lot about Jesus coming back. There was a training home that was learning to skin rabbits, you know, for the great, their persecution, yeah. Um, I, I would have signed up for that one. That's, yeah. uh, no, dude, I raised rabbits <laughs> right. in 4-H, oh, so I would definitely would not. I would have boycotted that. <laughs> yeah, that one. But you're supposed to. You you didn't go the you know yeah the I whole Megillah with 4-H if it's, you didn't <laughs> if you didn't eat the rabbit. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Matea. <laughs> and you had the fattest rabbit too, didn't you? Have like the prize winning rabbit. I didn't have the fattest. I had the mo I had the best behaved. Henry, my Netherland dwarf, was a all time oh. show all time show <laughs> rabbit, grand champion so of the Stanwood nice, Fair. Nice. Were you yeah. a rabbit cult leader? You had a no, dude. Well the term trained. is cunicologist, and this isn't about me. This is and the cults that I was a part <laughs> I think of. We're yeah. homeschooling. We want to yeah. know more about your rabbit. No, no, yeah. no. This is about Wendy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I really think it's interesting looking back on it. So, all these young families. You know, so we were college kids, and then we all started getting married, as you do, and then started ha having kids, as you do. And there was only a few couples that were, like, that much older than us, mm. like, say, 10 years, just yeah. 10 years older than us. And as all of those kids started to become teenagers, that was also the time that the Internet became a thing. Mm -hmm. And the teenagers were just asking questions, like, why? We were accepting it. Mm hmm you know, yes, you know, we, you got to wear a dress because of some verse in Leviticus and we cover our heads because of first Corinthians 11 and we, and, but then the teenagers are going, but why? Mm -hmm. And here's a podcast from somebody and you know, yeah, that, yeah. that has, that has an answer to that. Right, right. 
Well, um, probably a chat room back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. No podcast yeah. yet. That's yeah. right. Um, and so then, you know, there became this big push. And as parents, you know, and trying to be honest and good parents, I, I really think that's when it started to swell and to, um, and people started talking to each other, but privately. Mm. I mean, because if you, if you, yeah. If you question, question too publicly, then you were, you know, you get banished and, mm. you know, like when people left, people did leave, but there was always, you know, all their sins were paraded before everybody gossiped oh, no. around, yeah. you know, and they were banished uh, in a, you know, a twist of First Corinthians 5 or 6. So was it actually, like, was it clear, like, oh, these people left, like, you're to have no contact with them? Is yep. it that explicit? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was kind that's, of a rebel because I, I right kept... There. Yeah. Uh, contact with uh some of those people because they were my friend i mean i got right. to college with them yeah you know and and one of them uh my friend elaine they she and her husband left about 10 years before we did mm -hmm. and when everything imploded and we got together she couldn't believe how how much more legalistic and how much more controlling it had gotten things had become and she would tell you they really left because of their children mm -hmm. Because we did, we would have children's, our children in the meeting with us, mm -hmm. and we call it mat training. Like when they were babies, you know, they'd be on a mat next to us. Mm. And, and this is, this is to me, I discovered this afterwards, much to my uh, shame and agony, but, you know, disciplining a child to do what you wanted to obey sounded right, mm -hmm. but we were putting kids on a mat, training them for Sunday. So when a kid wanted to crawl, we were stopping them. Mm. When they wanted to vocalize, we were making them be quiet. I would now call that a form of abuse. Yeah. Because at the time I didn't know, yeah. you know, Erickson's model or Piaget or, mm -hmm. you know. Healthy childhood development. Yeah. And, identity formation. and so now I look back on it and just go, oh my goodness. Yeah. So you, cause you have, how many kids do you and John have? Seven. Seven kids. Was that it was it was big families a part of like that the the cult culture? It actually was not when uh, when John and I and this other couple started having kids. We really felt like that was just a response mm. to the Lord. Like in college, you'd hear everybody get like, um, "I'm you know I'm praying for the will of God for where I live, and I'm praying for the will of God for you know what I'm going to do for a living." Mm. And then when they got married, I'm praying for you know a spouse. Who's, who's the will of God for me to go right. through life with? But then as soon as I got married, I'm going to have two kids, you know. And so we just left that to God. Right. And it was a little controversial. But then by the end, yeah, almost everybody was having hmm. tons of kids. <laughs> how, did your, how did your kids navigate that? Like as, as you became or as you got to the season where you were departing from this yeah, yeah. movement, um, like, was there fallout with your kids? Oh, huge, huge. I mean, my kids, I think all of my kids should be in therapy till the end of their days <laughs> <laughs> because of what they endured. Like Anna, our oldest, was a very compliant baby. Mm -hmm. And so she really got the brunt of that, you know, stay on the mat, mat quiet training. down. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, just a lot of... I'm trying to think of all of it, but, but the control, like one of the things that the guru panicked, you know, when these high schools, high schoolers were starting to ask questions. So we would, um, have this thing in the summer called the teen team where we'd put all the high schoolers together from all over the country. They'd all come out from the Midwest and they would sit under his teaching in summer school, you know, and then they would go evangelize, you know, on the beaches and stuff in modest bathing suits. <laughs> <laughs> the purity thing yeah, uh -huh. of the 80s and 90s sure. was huge and um so this yeah, wasn't like a this wasn't just a regional cult this was this is like there was there's movements or houses or assemblies yeah. franchise offices franchise, yeah. <laughs> franchise offices um yeah was, so it, was, it wasn't just a california thing there was, was yeah no there was a lot in california because fullerton was kind of the base but the epicenter then, there okay um yeah, all over the country, Rhode Island, and yeah. a lot in the Midwest, and so it so the assembly ends. It all starts falling apart in two thousand three, if I understand. Uh, before that. Before but, that, okay. Yeah. 
Um, so what time did, when did you guys exit scene left? Yeah, so that was 2003. It was actually funny because John was a leading brother oh. in the group in Huntington Beach. What, the, what does that mean? So that, that meant he was in a plurality of leadership. Um, so there wasn't a pastor. There was four leaders, and he was one of them. Wow. And, um, and it, looking back on it, there was always one of those guys that was super loyal to George. Right. And uh, John was him. not one of those. Gotcha. Um, but probably about five years before the implosion, we really started to question, along with our teenagers, because there, w- that's it. One of the biggest things I think that damaged our children psychologically is they saw John and I making decisions for them that they knew John and I did not hold as a conviction Oh. because of the group. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot of feeling of, of we're not first they're making a choice for us because of this and mm-hmm. the seem that and they could they could sniff out that it wasn't your genuine belief or conviction and yeah. so they're watching a, a, f- a form of obedience and hypocrisy yeah, yeah yeah which really challenged us and you know we started talking about it you know my close friends behind closed doors you know we would talk about what's going on and george would preach that some churches, you know, have Ichabod written over over them. The glory has departed. And we started talking about that. Mm. Has the glory departed? And and mm. is there a revival? Because we we got this strange sense of <clears throat> we would go to the Tuesday night Bible study and it felt like the fellowship was broken. Mm. I mean, we're there with the same Bible, doing the same things, but it wasn't what it used to be. But then when I would take my kids to public school and would run into Christians, I could have real fellowship with them. Mm. And so it, it was kind of this curious thing. And then when you say the fellowship was broken, like the, so there just wasn't any vitality in, in, in anymore. Yeah. There was no like sense of like an, like a powerful animating spirit that like encouraged, sustained, inspired you. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Because, you know, right when I got saved, I, you know, I didn't know all about the Holy spirit, but I knew you know, like I could go to a party, no problem. Mm-hmm. But after I got saved, I started questioning things that were happening at parties. Mm. Or or more like somebody was questioning me. Mm. You know, like, should you be here? You yeah. know, is that cool? And and so here's the thing. Like I could see God talking to me the whole time. Mm. But I could also see when I, w- I wasn't following the Spirit. So when John and I left for like two years, this was our, our habit. We would go to bed at night and we would start laughing. Can you believe we ever believed? And then in the morning, we would get up and have our time with the Lord and have to repent. Uh, the Holy Spirit would bring back sp- specific <clears throat> situations mm. where we weren't following him. Mm. So, so I could really say the Lord was always faithful. But part of, part of being deceived is self-deception. Mm. Yeah, that comes from pride because you want to rise in the hierarchy of this thing. Sure, mm. you know you you might join it for community, but then, you know, then yeah. you want to rise. And you want affirmation. Yeah. You want yeah. praise. You want opportunity. You yeah. want influence. Mm. So there was there was a, a few couples, some of those older couples that had the teenagers that were a little older than us. They left, and then they started. Um, a, uh, you know, chat rooms and then uh, websites. They had a website where people were talking about it. And oh, we didn't have television. Like, you, you weren't supposed to have television mm-hmm. in your home. It's part of the um, isolationist right yeah. there. But yeah. when computers started going into every home, then, you know, you needed it for work. This was just part of the thing. And so you could sneak on and watch, you know, read these websites and go, oh, yeah, yeah. And so we all started talking about that. And then, and then the one couple, Steve and Margaret Irons, they were um, like George's right-hand couple. And they were the ones that left. And mm-hmm. then they were the ones that started. Margaret started the, um, the website. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, and just exposing, you know, the th- truths. But then they started also digging into George's past and... 
you know, George always said he had to leave the Plymouth Brethren because, you know, when he created this narrative, mm -hmm. he, w he was thrown out of the Pl Plymouth Brethren because he was having affairs which with is, women. Which is ultimately part of what led to the downfall of, of yes, the assembly it, it as well, Yes, became, right? it became, no, you know, we figured out that really he was having an affair with just about every other secretary. Mm. Oh, jeez. And... um and that his wife, like when she would find out about it, she would she would silence the women by saying, "You you could bring down a worldwide ministry." Yeah, of course. that's how that's like it's like the common narrative in that. Yeah. Yes, like yeah. Ravi Zacharias, same thing. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Geez. Mm -hmm. And so so that was found out. But then also, there was a gal who uh, Betty had a lot of. That's George's wife, had a lot of uh, health issues uh, that we think we don't know i mean because she would never come to meetings because she had these health issues and um there was a gal who kind of helped take care of her and she started becoming real convicted by the way george and betty were spending money mm. because she lived very sparsely mm -hmm. and simply and all of a sudden she just left mm. she was a real good friend of ours but she came from the east coast and she just went back and um, mm. and then, you know, so the money and the control and the affairs, and then there, they, uh, George and Betty had two sons, Tim and David, David was the older son and David was, uh, seriously abusing his wife and one of his daughters, yeah. one of his daughters lost hearing in one ear because of the amount of abuse. Oh my goodness. Um, that she was getting and then and then his wife was being abused and if you go you know if you go on the website you see all these these stories of um people saw her being abused mm -hmm. but and they would say things and and they were told it, it was being taken care of hmm. you know but also she was being blamed hmm. for the abuse if you would just submit if you would do what david wanted you know, and that's also pretty classic. Yeah. You know. Oh, sex, money, power. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Downfall and, every yeah. time. Nothing, nothing, nothing new, new under, under the, the sun. sun. <laughs> <laughs> so true. You know, I there's it's heartbreaking to hear the story. Just as it's heartbreaking to like you know this last couple of years, particularly in the evangelical church in the West, it's just felt like one story after another mm -hmm. of, yeah. of this same exact pattern playing mm -hmm. out, you know, which <clears throat> yeah. one of the reasons why I want us to have this conversation is because we're seeing the pattern replayed, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. because, so the temptations for ending up in places like this remain the same in each generation. And um, so in some ways, I'm hoping that we can all learn from your experience to how to like orient ourselves in a world where meaning is confusing or um, where people use and abuse the name of God or use and abuse scripture um, to, uh, to seemingly like healthier good ends that ultimately yeah. end up getting twisted. You know, as you said earlier, Joel, I appreciated the sort of humanity that you're granting everybody by saying nobody wakes up and thinks that they're going to join a cult. Um, yeah. And I think certain true sociopaths do maybe just say like, like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to start a cult, you know, yeah. um, I because I just want power control, sex, money, power, whatever. But most oftentimes it's also, it's this weird, strange, twisted tale of like, you know, good intentions and one bad decision after another. So yeah. I appreciate like what you're sharing, um, because it's a, it's a helpful Warning, I think it's good wisdom that we can all be paying attention to as we look at our current culture, mm -hmm. uh, the different communities of faith or practice that we're all involved in to say, well, hey, am I seeing any of these um, characteristics that we've described at work? And if so, like, well, hey, um, there's lots of resources out there uh, yeah. to help navigate that. And if you've been a part of one of those communities, there's lots of, I mean, I know our church has, which is actually where I want to go next, um, our church has, you know, like a free drop-in counseling center um, mm -hmm. because there's just so much trauma and abuse and heartbreak that's in the world. And, and unfortunately, a lot of that lays at the feet of religious communities. Uh, but yeah. I'm curious for you. So we've we've heard now how, like some of your guys' experience in that, and um, we've kind of got to see and hear a little bit of what, uh, what that looks like, life 
in t- of 25 years in a cult. And then we started to just name some of wh- how the wheels begin to fall off, how the cracks begin yeah. to show and which ultimately lead to you guys leaving. And you even started to share some of how after you guys had left and you're kind of scoffing at your past selves, how could yeah. we ever believe you recognize, well, actually, well, God was still there and present during that time, actually uh-huh. kind of always speaking to us and yeah. convicting us in different ways. You have uh, some of the best reason. Anybody who's experienced abusive spiritual communities or abusive spiritual leaders has the best reason to doubt God, his goodness, yeah. and to say, hey, I don't want to have anything to do with you, God, and I don't, I definitely don't want to have anything to do with spiritual communities anymore. Yeah. But that is not your story. I met you in a church. Yes. Uh, you are very, you're a very involved leader in our church. Yeah, you yeah. and John serve. Um, and you... what's, what's funny about that is one week we were in Huntington Beach and the leading brothers were disbanding the assembly in Huntington Beach. Mm-hmm. And the very next week, the very next Sunday, we were at North Coast Calvary Chapel. No way. So it was just like you didn't have a decompression season, uh, you know, or anything. We you had didn't... a decompression season, but at North Coast. So it's it's interesting. Um, the brothers got together, and we, the whole church came together. We're having a special meeting. No head covering so the women could talk. Ooh. <laughs> Watch out. Dangerous. Yeah. yeah. And in Huntington Beach, uh, one of George's granddaughters and her husband were there. And so it was all, there were letters that were read and it was all brought out that George was being excommunicated from his own cult. Uh, but the the leading brothers in Huntington Beach wanted to disband and they just said, get into healthy churches. Hmm. Hmm. And one guy said, I don't think we should be together. I don't think it's healthy. You know, we really do have to find that healing journey on our own. Hmm. And, uh, John and I really felt like the Lord was speaking to us to, uh, I, I was reading a verse that said, go home now, mm. as you have believed, so be it done unto you. Mm. And uh, so we, just because of different circumstances, we started praying about that, that Sunday afternoon, mm. because the Lord was speaking to me, the Lord was speaking to John, and then we'd been renting a house in Fountain Valley for 13 years, but... Uh, the Vietnamese couple that were our landlords told us when the, you know when we signed the lease that they were saving the house for uh, when they finally got their family out of Vietnam. Mm. And so Sunday the church is disbanding. Monday Nam calls us and he goes, "Wendy, I'm so sorry." He goes, "But we're gonna have to take back the house." And I'm going, "Nam, you got your family out. That's what that means, right? Mm-hmm. You know." And yeah. so that's what it meant. I go, "No problem. We'll be gone." In the meantime, my father had died, and my mom was saying, hey, does anybody want this? She didn't need a four-bedroom house in Carlsbad. And so we just left. Wow. Hmm. But John felt like we should uh, not get in the habit of forsaking the, the assembling of our shelves together. He was 1025. <laughs> so um, there was a San Diego branch office of the cult, and we talked to one of the guys there because they had disbanded the week a week or two before us. And he goes, yeah, I went to this church that wasn't too bad, was his thing. And he said, North Coast. If you look, we literally looked in a phone book because that's what he said. We opened the phone book and there's a ton of North Coast yeah. Yeah. all over. And John goes, you, do you remember what he said? I go, I don't know. And he goes, that one's in Carlsbad. Let's go there. And so we showed up at North Coast Calvary. Um, the girls and I were all in flower print dresses with lace collars. Mm-hmm. Uh, the guys were all in shirt, shirts and ties. And, and we felt like we were really going on into enemy territory. Like, is this right? Wow. And, um, so what year is this? Uh, is February 2003. Okay. So Mark Foreman was the... So Mark Foreman. He wasn't preaching that day, but... Um, Do you remember who was? There was a lot of funny stories. So uh, Debbie walked up to us. She was the children's ministry leader. I and mean, she saw all these kids. When she saw us, she goes, oh, here's a homeschool family. And uh, so she goes, she, she, the first thing she said to us was, are you lost? Oh, no. And John and I looked at each other like, oh, honey, you don't even know yeah. <laughs> how lost we are. Because we were really just spiritually beat up and yeah, dazed sure. and confused. And sure. so she goes, she goes, you know, like, and she starts telling us where the kids will go, you know, to different. And we're like, no, no, we 
we're keeping the kids with us. Yeah, they're mat trained. Yeah, they're mat trained. Yeah, so we went in and we just sitting there, you know, with them like Russian nesting dolls, you yeah. know, right down, right down the line. And uh, what was funny was she, Debbie has never done this before or since, but she was on announcements with Jim, and she said, you know, if you're new here and she's supposed to do the card thing, uh -huh. well, she doesn't do that. She goes, there is a new family here, Hinman, stand up. <laughs> We just wanted to... She's like, from one cult to another. Yeah. We just wanted to melt into the carpeting. But, <laughs> oh, no. um, she had to stand up. But the funny thing was uh, then J Jim takes over and he goes, he goes, we're going to have a time of tithes and offerings. And so Jeremy, our third grade son, you know, looks around and he goes, you know, nobody's wearing ties. They're really serious about this ties and offering things. He was the first boy, so he pulls his clip on and tie off, throws it in the, yes. the offering bag. That's, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. That's such I a look great at John story. and he's just like, "It's great. Let it pass." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're probably wondering why there's this clip on tie <laughs> being with the offerings. Jeremy's like, <laughs> "Finally, this church rule." Yeah, yeah. Thing off me. But then, so Jeff Frankie was actually preaching. Oh no! From, way. Uh, cool. from Philippians, he's preaching on money because that's what it says, you know. Yeah. And um. And our kids were just, you know, hitting each other, going, that's right, it's right there. Yeah. They had the Bibles open. They were taking notes. Amazing. Oh, my gosh. Um, what, did that, what did that next season with your family look like? Because I can only imagine, you know, like, yeah, your kids are along for their journey. So it's like, oh, right. they didn't know, you know, everybody's sitting a, sat in a boring church yeah, service yeah. before. So yeah. it doesn't matter if it's a cult or if it's North yeah. Coast Calvary Chapel or if it's whatever. But... What was that like for you guys in this discovery of just newness of yeah. of life and of spirituality and freedom and a new congregation yeah. and um and I'm I'm just I'm thinking like through the the, the eyes of your kids. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, like, yeah, well you should have any of our kids. The older ones, the older the better. Uh my oldest daughter actually wants to do a podcast. Really? You know, yeah. of this is what mom was doing, this is what yeah. we were doing. Um because they just really got messed around. I mean, it was bad in the cult, mm -hmm. super strict, purity rings, mm -hmm. sure. you know, all that, mm -hmm. that stuff. And then we come to North Coast. And this was really on John and I, not on North Coast. Um, the opposite happened. Mm. I mean, we just felt like as parents, we didn't know what to do. Mm. And, and we had these kids that were, they, you know, probably not rebelling any different than any other, you know, Teenager, teenager. Yeah. Um, but we just kind of loosened the reins, mm -hmm. which I think ultimately scared them to death because now they, and they had this, they had a, they had a little secret cabal of Hinman kids, you know, where they would talk about things, but they wouldn't let mom and dad know. <laughs> <laughs> Classic kids. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. uh, yeah, actually one of our kids would tell us that she was going to, you know, youth group and she'd be smoking dope behind Ralph's shopping center with some Classic. of the other kids from yep. church. Classic, yeah, <laughs> Christian kids. Yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Uh, from neckties and lace collars to smoking dope behind the grocery yeah. store. Yeah, that, it was really that kind of whiplash. Yeah, for our kids. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's. I don't blame them. I yeah. probably would have done the same yeah. in a lot of different ways. In fact, I did do the same in my own in my own mm -hmm. way. Um, but that's a story for another podcast. Yeah. Um. Okay, so I guess. You know, um, a few more questions for you, our friend uh, Wendy. Um, Ooh, can I ask one? Please. How, I mean, <clears throat> how did you become a Bible teacher through all this? You went from an environment where female Bible teaching, no way, right? right? Yeah, yeah. And I've just, I've always known you. You're, oh, you're Wendy Hinman. You're like, yeah. you're the Bible teacher. <laughs> like, tell me how that came to well, be. Well, I think the Lord was really. Uh, it was really good. Like, we, you know, we started Debbie because she was the first person we met and we had all these kids. Then the next Sunday we did put, you know, we weren't in dresses and ties. Uh, and we did put the kids in children's ministry and stuff. And she, I had seven kids. She needed volunteers. Mm. So we started volunteering in children's ministry and then she needed uh, a fifth, sixth coordinator. So she goes, what do you think? Because she saw, you know, that I could handle kids and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And I really think it was the Lord putting me with children and taking me back to the basics. Mm. And, and teaching children is the hardest. Mm -hmm. It's it absolutely the hardest. the hardest. If you can teach children, 
You can teach anybody. Yeah. Um, because to take those abstract thoughts and ideas and you know bring them down to something chewable, and so that's what you know what happened. But when you know it's funny because when she was trying to hire me, I'm going. We were in a cult like three months ago, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> you know if you know Debbie, it's like what I don't yeah. care, you know. Like, <laughs> Do this, you know, and then so one time she she told me she goes Mark Foreman wants to meet you, and the first thing I said to her was, "What did I do wrong? Mm. Uh, what did we wow. do? Did we do something wrong?" Mm. Because and then and then she, yeah, she's looking at me like I you know what do you mean? And she just dumps me in Mark's office, and he starts asking me about the cult, but he's like trying to pastor me, mm. shepherd. He goes, "If you want to sit in the back of the church and do nothing." that's fine, you know? And he goes, have you ever read? And I was like, oh, no. And he pulled out Churches at Abuse. Mm. And he goes, the guy who wrote this book, who was an enemy of ours, mm. Ron Enroth, because, uh, and I just go, oh, we're chapter 12. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> wow. And I thought that's what he was trying to do. Like, he was going to say, you know, you there's going to be some form of discipline over us or something because right, we're right. from chapter 12. Yeah. But he just wanted to communicate that we believe in adult to adult relationship mm. and what that means. And, and that it was okay for you guys to take time and space to heal. Yeah. And yeah, to, yeah. Yeah. It's you, awesome. You didn't have to perform. You didn't have to do anything. And that, I mean, it makes so much sense. You're coming from a context where authoritarian control, like fear and fear and control, right? Are you towing the party line? Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I'm so glad that you guys found, a, a church where you had the opportunity to experience some, a, a different side of God, a different side of, of faith, and that it has been like a healthy thing yeah. for for you. And uh, I mean, I I definitely know. I'm I'm super grateful that when I landed at North Coast, that there were people like you and John around. Uh, it gave me great encouragement and hope. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Healthy community. Yep. Mm -hmm. I was just a decade behind you. Observable yeah. boundaries. Yeah. Observable boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I guess, is there, you know, um, if you could say anything to our, our listeners, you know, uh, in terms of, yeah, like lessons or wisdom to distill from this kind of wide ranging, ranging conversation and your experience about, yeah, about navigating um, religious authority or na say that they're in, you know, they recognize throughout this conversation, they're like, hey, actually, I kind of hear some of, you're describing some of like my community, um, yeah, yeah. you know, like, what would you say to them? How would you encourage or equip them? Well, I would say, how were you saved? How did you come to faith? Because Paul says, Galatians, who has bewitched you? Mm. And he's calling them back to the original faith. Mm. And when I, I have to go back to that voice I heard when I was five, when I was getting in my, grand, my great aunt's Buick. That's that, well, I really believe when, the first time I heard the word, the, the speaking voice of God, mm. then eight years old when I asked my mom, what is this? Mm. You know, because everybody put the nativity scene on the television in the 60s. And it was all Santa Claus and snowmen except for this thing. And, and she, I believe she shared the gospel with me. Mm. And I remember just that overwhelming feeling of, of, of knowing my sin, but then there's a savior, mm. that sort of bittersweetness. Mm. And then Yosemite, and then young life. And, and hearing... I was hearing God, but then I was letting that go. I wasn't, I wasn't dialing into that and making choices for myself mm. based on that. It was overlaid with another voice. Mm -hmm. And, and then there was, like, it was one of the things they would do in the cult is if they thought you were going to leave, they'd promote you. And so there was a <laughs> lot good. of, there was a lot of good pride strategy. and, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, yeah. stuff. So, um, surrendering that voice to the group. Mm. Don't surrender the voice of God to the group. And sometimes you need fellowship to mm -hmm. be able to discern the voice of God. You need counsel. Mm -hmm. But but ultimately, the decision is between you and God. Mm. Particularly when it says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Mm. That's between a wife and God. Not That's right. That's, it's mm -hmm. not a something for a man to tell a woman that's what right. to do that's right. mm -hmm. any more than a woman should tell 
a husband. You need to love me. Right. <laughs> Lay your right. life down. Because it says right here. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things I love about that response, Wendy, is it, it highlights two things to me. One, the personal and relational nature of God, right? We, we mentioned yeah. it earlier. Hey, what's something that each of us in our own way and so many countless people uh, encounter in the Christian story is a God who looks and acts and speaks so differently than um, the deities depicted elsewhere. And mm-hmm. one that moves towards us and moves towards us with, with tenderness, yeah, with, yeah. A, with a desire to relate, to, unpo- to empower, to unleash, you know, to, to raise up and to mature rather than to suppress and keep down, to keep subservient. And so you're just, I'm hearing you describe, yeah, a God who is speaking constantly, yeah. gently, yes. You know, and it's not this voice of shame. It's not this anger. You know, yeah. um, it, there there may be conviction, as you mentioned earlier in your story, but it's always this persistent and it's this questioning. Hey, yeah, you, like, yeah. what are you doing here? Is this where you belong? Yeah, yeah. Like, what's yeah. going on? Is that Do right? you believe that this is yeah, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, on the one hand, you're describing an active relational God um, who's constantly pursuing you, constantly speaking to you. Yeah. On the other hand, you're saying. Hey, we are personally responsible. Like you have yes. to take responsibility for your own life, for your yeah. own faith, yeah. and for that that excruciating mm-hmm. in some ways difficulty of navigating is this the voice of God? Is this yeah, the will yeah. of God? Like what is right action in this in this situation, yeah, yeah. you know? But it li- like it's it's this beautiful terrifying vision of yeah. faith that you're painting because it leaves us nowhere to hide. I mean, that's one of the things that I noticed about the, you know, your experience in the cult and and any experience of tribalism that we see in culture or in the church yeah, yeah. now is that it's uh you watch these beautiful individuals disappear into yes. a, um, a mass, like a mob, right? Yeah, yeah. Where there is no creative thought. There is no like true like individuality. There's a, there's a gross regurgitation of the party line. Yeah. And then there's this dehumanization of people who are on the other, as you mentioned earlier, oh, he was our enemy. Yeah, the guy yeah. who's describing yeah, yeah. abusive, you know, churches. Yeah, in cults, they're always in, a, they inflame shame. Mm. So you're always living out of your shame. Yeah. And always trying to make up for it. But the opposite of shame is glory. Mm. And when God speaks, that's glory. When you see more of God, mm. that is glory. And that's how you... That's I don't one think I've of ever heard that before. The opposite disturbing. of shame is glory. Wow. I'm going to have to think about that one for a minute. That's beautiful. I think that's going to be our little social media. Like, Wendy Hinman, that'll be the... That'll be what plays the little fifteen-second clip. Uh, the op- That's the opposite of that's like so poetic and beautiful. And Indeed. thank you yeah. for sharing that. I, I get it from the Word of God. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can't copyright that. <laughs> it's true, but you can make it your own, and you have, and we're grateful yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, this it's so interesting, Wendy's. So often, you know, I love I love talking with you because you're always overflowing with with beautiful stories of fascinating people that you've met in books or in real life, your travels around the world. Um, and you're also constantly overflowing with the words of God, mm-hmm. but not in, you know, in this really organic way, this way that like, that always invites curiosity that encourages um, faith and life or affirms, you know, me and, and others where so often in my experience in churches, I've, I'll meet people who are constantly spouting, scripture and yeah. it feels so brittle it feels so shallow it feels so instrumental mm-hmm. it doesn't feel yeah. like it doesn't lead me to glory yeah, right? yeah. It, it, mm-hmm. it's it's always i'm i'm like you are i don't know you're yeah. you're bastardizing it in some yeah. sad way so thanks yeah, for not yeah. being that sort of well, person because it's there's a it's very black and white that was the thing in the cult everything was very black and white and when religion takes the incomprehensibility and the mystery out of God and, you know, makes him, you can do it with a cult, you can do it with Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. That's what they're doing. They're making everything very black and white Mm -hmm. and prescribed. And, and people are surrendering Mm. um, the ways of Jesus to a political group think. Mm -hmm. And it's the, you know, it's the same thing um, where when, you know, it says, I think it's in Proverbs, where it says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. Oh yeah. And it's and it's not that he is, um, you know, just being stingy and like you know let them figure it out. But it's like he's, wait till they find out this. Yeah. 
that's glory. Mm-hmm. You know, when we discover, and he wants us to use our own will and faculties and heart and mind, and then when we discover it, to the del- it's delight. glory. Yeah. yeah. Well said. Yeah, well, I guess because upon discovering glory, what's our response? Our response is wonder. It's awe. It's admiration. It's, you know, um, it's, yeah, yeah this, this beautiful outpouring of what's deepest inside of us. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I think... <clears throat> As you're mentioning, like Christian nationalism, the black, black and whiteness, so much of the false false religions promise, hey, hand me a reason, hand yeah. me, you know, your your fidelity, and I will give you safety. I will like I will protect yeah. you, and I alone will protect you from the complexities of the world, from the threats of those yeah. those others, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and God doesn't seem to be saying that so often, as I know Him and as I see Him in Scripture. Instead, He's saying, like, well, hey, I will give you myself. Yeah. Um, unto death, I will give you my enlivening spirit. I will strengthen and empower you to to move with purpose and force out yes. into the complexity. To what? Not to mm-hmm. conquer and to subdue it, um, but to cultivate it like a garden. To to be a person of peace amidst chaos. To which is really that is what glorifying God looks like, right? Yeah. That is yeah. being that person who is can be loving when other people are being hateful, who can be peaceful when other people are anxious, you know? Um, yeah, and to, and, and to point towards freedom, freedom yeah. and responsibility. Yes. Yeah. Well, man, we could, I feel like we could keep talking for like another three hours, but this is not He's, the Joe Rogan podcast. No, yeah, it's not. <laughs> um, but we do, okay, Joel, we're, I think, Unless you've got any other questions or unless you want to say anything else, we like towards the end of our conversations, we started doing this thing called hot takes. Yeah, I've got one yeah. more before Great. we go hot takes. Okay, one more. What would you say to someone who might stumble upon this conversation who might say, whoa, I'm checking those boxes? Mm-hmm. Like what what what's your invitation to people who are either caught up in quote unquote a cult mm-hmm. or even just in a in a group think tribal mm. scenario yeah, where you're yeah. just going, man, this isn't healthy. And and the thing that I, I always kind of am curious about is like, do I stay and reform this? Do I rebel right. and fight against it? Or do I yeah, quietly yeah. exit? Like, how, right. Um, and that came up in all, our thinking all, all three of those things. Yeah. Mm. So I think, um, I guess, yeah, that's my question. What, what would be your um, invitation to someone who's maybe trapped in a similar situation. And they recognize that they're trapped? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're coming aware. They're becoming aware yeah. of their situation. And they're wondering, yeah, is, is this... Um, I would say go talk to a pastor at another church. Because mm. that's one of the things that we really found when we disbanded. Some of the groups stayed together. I would say 85% of the people in the United States left... Either either left the faith or left for other churches, and and grew in health, um, mm. but fifty probably fifteen percent stayed together, justified George and what happened, and they became darker, mm. more abusive, mm. more entangling, and one of those. Uh, one of the brothers from one of those churches asked me to write something because he was trying to justify the whole thing. And I, and he said, we're being attacked by these people. And I said, put yourself under in accountability, put yourself under um, accountability of three pastors in the town where you're at. Hmm. Just go find them and get under, you know, because we've been deceived. Right. Hmm. And so if we're ever questioning something that looks so black and white, we need to go read something we disagree with. Yeah. We mm. need to talk to people we disagree with. Sure. And 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 then it it becomes clear. Yeah. Much well, more clear. If you believe if you know, my experience with truth is that it is the truth is real. It exists. Um I need to be humble in what I claim to know is truth and its boundaries, but that truth is resilient and will stand up to inquiry yeah, and yeah. to curiosity. Mm-hmm. And um, so, like, if I if I'm afraid to challenge a belief of mine, it's probably yeah. that fear is actually that it's probably telling me something is that that maybe that truth isn't. True, yes. Yes. Right? You know, Definitely. maybe it's a yeah. maybe it's an idol of my own. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm a, if I'm unwilling to say, well, hey. Let me go hear um, a good argument against it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And any any time you hear a man say, I, "I'm going to start my own church," 
run, <sighs> run fast, <laughs> run away. <laughs> yeah. Or if any church is starting and they say that they have, you know, the corner on the market <clears throat> of some kind of truth. Mm-hmm. Every church needs vision. Yes. But if if it's like we're better than everybody else, that's why you should come here. Yeah. That's the beginning, even if they're not already cult status. You yeah. can grow into that. Yeah. I yeah, that's a hundred that's so right. Uh, and yeah, I remember I had a friend who out of spite was planning a church. He's like, Oh, I was so burned by this last church. I'm gonna yeah, go yeah. I'm like, dude, don't. You're gonna become exactly that same. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna create the same environment yes. that you were yeah, so hurt yeah. by. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's so wise. It's like, yeah, where there's vision, the you know, uh, where there's no vision, the people um, what's perish. That perish. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I just, uh, yeah, it's it's so it's so easy. I think it, this is my takeaway here is like, it, when you hear the word cult, it's so distant mm-hmm. and it's so radical. Yeah. But really, what like what you're describing, like just a toxic community. I don't even yeah. know if that's the right word, but. Um, it's really easy to get caught up in the, in that. It's really, yeah, yeah. it's a lot, it's a lot more um, accessible and invitational than one might think. And yeah, um, yeah. And, yeah and I think a lot of the political, spiritual climates today are, mm-hmm. are leading um, people into those, those realities. And it's, it's yeah. really dangerous. And especially it's, given it's really the amount tragic. of time we spend and the younger generation, um, mine included spends online as well. It's even oh, easier yeah. when you're, div- when it's, you're not in yeah, flesh yeah. and blood relationship, yeah. you know, yeah. when you can push back or you can be yeah. curious when it's, when it's all yeah. out in the ether. Yeah. Well, but, the beginning of the internet was really part of the unraveling sure. of our cult. And so we thought, Oh, this is never going to happen again. Yeah. Right. And well, now you was... have these echo chambers that oh, make man. it even worse. Oh, yeah. That was the great initial hope of the internet, right? Like, well, hey, democratization of information is it, we're going to break down these silos and it's going to liberate people. <laughs> yeah. And now it's uh, like so many all this is why we can't have nice things, people. We just have this we have this penchant in us and it's it's in all of us. We're yeah. capable yeah. of doing it, of taking these things that are good, that have great potential yeah. uh, and for creativity and for health and for healing and beginning to twist them yeah. and bend them towards darker ends, you know, uh, and we're infinitely clever at justifying why we need to do that. Yes. Um, well, you have any hot takes? Oh I got, yeah, I got, I got hot takes. Uh Oh, okay. So what's, what are the hot take rules? Oh, you just have to answer it's, the question. It's rapid fire. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's hot, it's hot yeah. potato. It's, we right, just, right. we're the ones asking yeah. the questions. Yeah. Don't try and turn the tables. <laughs> um, I'll start with this one. There's no wrong answers. Yeah. 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 Okay. Kool-Aid flavors, let's say fruit punch or grape. Oh, grape, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah. Just on topic of cults. Yeah. Um, in Carl, what's uh, what's the best restaurant that I haven't heard of in Carlsbad? The best restaurant that you Ooh, haven't heard of? Great read. question. Yeah, that is a great question because I don't know the ones you've heard of. And you're in the village. But uh, I'm 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 new to Carl. I used to avoid coming here. So mm-hmm. I'm Ocean Cider. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know. So you know Lola's. Garcia's, yeah. Norte. I haven't been to Garcia's. Prontos. Yes, Prontos. Prontos. Well, good. Now I yeah. just feel reassured that we've yeah. got we've we're been going to yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, so you're in line at I, I have to think. Uh, am I forgetting any advertisers? <laughs> <laughs> uh, best thing on the menu at Lola's. Chicken enchiladas. Okay. Ooh, yeah. enchiladas. Okay. All right. Um, best hike within an hour and a half drive of here. Oh, great question. Mm. Mount Baldy. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. You kind of dangerous in wintry conditions though. People die on Baldy it every is. year. I almost fell on the Devil's Backbone in snow once. That's another story. That's, <laughs> we'll have you. We'll have you back, Wendy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, favorite non-spiritual author. Joan Didion. Joan Didion. Okay. Mm-hmm. Second time she's yeah. come up today. Cali- right. Californian writer. Yeah. So brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Okay, what's your oh. f- favorite recommendation of hers then? Best book of hers? Um, uh, the Slouching One. Why am I forgetting it? Slouching Towards Bethlehem? It's from, the, it's, a, it's about the 60s. Okay. But it's from the poem, so I'm forgetting if that's, but yeah. That's enough. Google it. You'll be able to Google find it. Google it. Yeah, you'll find it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is a Carlsbad Magazine question. Most interesting person in Carlsbad that you've interviewed? That is still in Carlsbad? Sure. Um, or that I've interviewed. Uh, let's answer both the questions. Uh, one. So I'm, I'm waffling between 
Robert Stromberg, who uh, his his great great grandfather built the Victorian Mansion downtown, okay, yeah. where San Diego is. Uh-huh. Yeah. But he's won two Academy Awards for special effects. Uh, cool. Pirates of the Caribbean 2 and Avatar. Oh, wow. And then he directed Maleficent. That was fascinating because oh, I knew nothing about that world and yeah. I yeah. spent the day in Hollywood with him. So so that, and then um, Hugh Martin. I actually did that for Encinitas Magazine. He's a Broadway composer, uh, okay. famous for, most famous for Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. No. Oh. Yes. Dude, um, one of the greatest what all a hit. time. His best music friends music. were uh, Gene Kelly and Judy Garland, and Gene Kelly's wife. Hacks. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, and we became friends after I interviewed him, and a uh, great believer. And I ask him, I ask him, I go, Hugh, I'd been talking to him about four hours, and I go, Hugh, you haven't talked to me about being gay. Who told you I was gay? And I, you know, so I get to pull out a great Will, Will and Grace line. Hugh, blind and deaf people know you're gay. <laughs> 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 but then he, he shared his testimony with me. And, he, and then he, and he said, he goes, when you know your purpose in Christ, mm. how small is your sexuality? Mm. Ooh. Yeah. Um, mm. You know. What a line. And, wow. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, he was he's a fascinating guy. And he didn't get saved until his seventies, I think. Mm. Wendy could Wendy could answer that question all day because she's interviewed everybody. I know. Yeah. She, she she's like anytime yeah, yeah. we're like short on story leads, we, we go like, to Wendy. Wendy, who do you know? It's, well, there's this person. That, yeah. Um, <laughs> worst worst uh worst thing about Carlsbad. Growth. Yeah. Okay, be <laughs> second yeah. to, to growth. <laughs> that's that's too easy. Uh well, I think the loss of community, the loss of small town, um, you know, we used to walk, we lived near Carlsbad High School and we would walk to the beach and be gone all day, come back when the street lights are on. Yeah. And um, if we, I mean, we had to mind our P's and Q's because if we did anything wrong, our parents would know by the time we got home. <laughs> yeah. And that, that loss of everyone knows everyone. Yeah. That's it's, hard. It's still kind of there. Like I was sitting with a friend at Pure Project and uh, she was like, do you know everybody? <laughs> I go, no, but, you know, when you've been here since yeah. kindergarten. Or before that, actually. Okay, I got one. You got one? Uh, for This is for the Bi- Wendy, the Bible teacher. Uh-huh. Um, twofold. Two Bible-related questions, and this, I think, will cap it off for me. Um, what is the most inconvenient truth that you would like to to dismiss from scripture. Jeez. Why submit to your husbands. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very inconvenient for me. <laughs> Always has been. Yeah. I guess the other one was going to be, so maybe, maybe I, uh, I thought I had a better one, but I think the second one was like, if there was a book of the Bible that you wish didn't make it into the canon, Ooh. what would it be? Mm. That is a hard one. I can uh, answer that. Yeah. Leviticus is too easy. Um, yeah, there's, it's more parts than whole books. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, Book of Ruth, man. I knew you were going to say yeah. Ruth. He's, he's so I mean, What are you against Ruth? Ruth? It's, I, I don't it's a, like that's it. a topic for another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, so I have to teach. I just, I that's where I was last Ruth. week. Yeah, yeah. Also pray for all of his Old Testament students who've been taught Ruth wrongly. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> no, I teach it well. I know you do. I, I, know. I just think Rahab should ha- should have the book. Oh. I think all the yeah, wonderful yeah. things about Ruth are better demonstrated through Rahab. Huh. Okay. God's faithfulness. Yeah. Or the lineage to Christ, and I, there's so many questions about Ruth or about Rahab that I have. I'm like, she's the hero. Yeah. Yeah. Ruth's great. I don't know. The story's weird. <laughs> the story's weird. Anyways, Why I, that was fresh on my brain, yeah, so I'm yeah. sorry, to, sorry no, no. to have to answer that, but yeah. I just, just this no. is where I'm at. I didn't think about Ruth, yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. Oh, and Rachel just told me, she goes, yeah, but with the Dead Sea Scrolls, like the one little discrepancy uh-huh. is the book of Ruth. I'm like, toss it out! 
<laughs> well, I mean, dude, Dead Sea Scrolls. Now we're talking about a Qumran community. Like, we're just, it all gets weird. Yeah. 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 Weird. yeah. <laughs> Ooh, yes. Answer, yes. <laughs> hey, Wendy, thank you so much sure, for joining yeah. us. Uh, thanks for Always writing for time. us. Thanks yep. for uh, the ways that you've been a, a part of and a champion of, uh, you know, the nation's project and experiment. And we anticipate your involvement in many ways to come here in the future. So it's been a joy and a pl- privilege. And I'm sure we'll have you back to talk about some interesting stuff in the future. We love you, Wendy. We do. Thank you, guys. I love you. Over and out from Nations Media. Over and out from Nations Media. How long is your podcast? I'm assuming that a lot of editing.